Hello and welcome to another episode of Cyberspeak with InfoSec Institute. Today on the show, we're talking to Joshua Knight, cybersecurity business leader with Dimension Data. Joshua has 30 years experience in security, including national security experience. experience. Today, we're going to talk about his security career journey, as well as the steps that you can take today to move your career toward the path of Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO. Based in Dallas, Texas, Joshua Knight currently utilizes 30 plus years of security consulting, professional services, and managed security service experience, serving as Vice President and General Manager responsible for the Dimension Data Security Services practice. Before joining Dimension Data, Joshua served as Global Vice President over Cognizant's Security Solutions Business 2016-2018, partner inside IBM's Professional Services Organization 2013-2016, Executive Director in Ernst & Young's IT Transformation Business 2012-2013, and is a Director responsible for AT&T Managed Security Service Businesses between 2006 and 2012. Starting in 1999, Joshua built the Sprint Security Services business where he was responsible for constructing and the implementation advisory and managed security service teams. Joshua also served in two startup companies where he served as GM of North American Sales and Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO, between 1993 and 99. Uh, this includes significant hands-on new venture experience with Angel and Series A and B funding. During his career, Joshua has enjoyed using life-changing technology to transform businesses, cultures, and societies. He currently holds a master's in business administrations from Friends University and an undergraduate degree in physics, mathematics, and chemistry from Friends University. Joshua, thank you for being here today. Hey, great. Uh, well, let's start out with something from the, uh, from the bio there. It says, you enjoy using life-changing technologies to transform businesses, cultures, and societies. What do, what do you mean by that? So as... The evolution of technology has occurred. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that I've enjoyed the last 15 years, especially is through virtualization, when I went through GSX, ESX, and as that's moved now into what is cloud today, and also through mobility, using such as Handspring, Pocket PC, and then watching that transform as we went into the Kyocera device, as the Palm evolved into what is the phone today around iPhone, Android, and then also artificial intelligence and the work mm -hmm. that I've through IBM and many of the others, as we also, the, the, the pieces coming from analytics and so on and so forth. So that digital transformation journey. So I've enjoyed using those aspects of technology. And of course that stems all the way back from when I began in technology years ago and as just a little kid and, and playing around inside computer labs. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that. How, what, what, what got you excited about computers eventually or originally? And also how did that transition into security interest? Sure. So, you know, for some people, they started their career in technology. They would tinker around with computers at an early age, or they, they moved into it through college, university, what have you. For me, as a kid, I was in trouble, uh, like any other little kid who couldn't keep his, uh, his nose clean. So my father, a college professor, asked me to come into the computer labs. Wow. With that request, I was able to access into DARPAnet, into the World Wide Web 2, and uh, BBCs, uh, BBSs. And so because of all of those opportunities, at, I was only 10 or 11 years old, my, uh, my breadth of understanding and knowledge around how hacking takes place inside of the Ixes, and I was playing around with Unix, and of course, as Linux evolved and then moved into Windows later on in my career, I was able to, to really get my arms around what most folks don't have an opportunity because I had those technologies at my fingertips through the university. Yeah, you were putting your, your, your hours in very, very early, it seems. I was, I was, I, I wasn't getting the grades in uh, junior high and high school. I did in college for sure. Okay. Even I was always playing around and there weren't books that were out there that made it easy. It was all around um, trial and error. And of course the university professors who were there, who PhDs always were helping and, and really peeling back the layers of the onion. And I always had a resource I could go back to and talk with. As um, people of our age who, you know, have, you know, grown up with computers, but also had a time when, when computers really weren't a thing, um, obviously, that means that you've sort of been there since the beginning of what's now known as cybersecurity. That wasn't always sort of part of it. So how has the cybersecurity landscape uh, changed or evolved since you first got involved? So it's interesting. With security, you're right. In the very beginning, when I entered my career, and I moved eventually into government, even then, they didn't have a GS system set up in order to address of hackers that were coming in. And I was considered a white hat hacker. Um, I went through a, a contract vehicle called FTS 2001 that opened that door inside of Sprint. Now, at that point, the evolution of security took place. I can remember sitting down with the, uh, the head of the FBI inside the Midwest out of the Kansas City office back in uh, 97, 98. And he began to really open my eyes to what this evolution might look like. And that's where network security started. 
Now, in my career over the last 20 some years, I'll say, before it became about the, com- the commodity it is today, we moved from network security, then eventually we moved into what was internet security. And then, of course, that went into what is information security. And now that evolution into what is digital security. Mm-hmm. So that transformation through three, four major phases or paradigm shifts, they've each built on each other and been very relevant to each other, but it's become that, that new way or new focus in security and, and as we move to that tomorrow. Yeah. How, how did you get involved with, you said you have, you have national security experience. How did you get involved with, with that aspect of cybersecurity? Sure. So back when I was in the startup space, we had a parental control product that was housed inside the network and not at the endpoint. Okay. Um, it, it did well for us, but it came to a place where Microsoft gave that away in MSN 9.0. When they gave that away for free, although the end user didn't understand the real differences, I'm like, why would I pay for your service, although far better, um, when I can get it for free? So I came to that place where I was I was out of career and needed to find a, a next level. So I sent my resumes out to uh, the DOD, I'm sorry, to the FBI, the DOJ, and the NSA. And from there, they then contacted me through Sprint, asking me to come work for Sprint through this contract vehicle. So I didn't work directly for those agencies, but I did do a fantastic amount of work for the agencies through Sprint and the contract vehicle. So that's how I, I ended up inside of the national security space. Can you, uh, is it, are you able to say what you, what you did uh, in, that, in that role? Mm-hmm. Yes. So in the beginning of that role as a white hat hacker, I was actually hacking into uh, the FBI, into the DOJ, into those different websites from the outside in, finding vulnerabilities as a, as a penetration tester or vulnerability assessment expert. And then eventually that evolved into an example during the Olympics. They wanted me to break into the Olympics for the Winter Olympics to make sure that we couldn't get to the data around the, uh, the U.S. Olympians. Okay. Or my, my, my best part about one of my, my highlights of my career was I actually broke in and got to all the Olympic data for everybody across the world. Now, wow. today, that would not happen, right? Things, well, we would hope it would happen, but things right. have been changed, right? Yeah. Um, then, of course, I did work for uh, the DOD and some other the other agencies around breaking into uh, foreign governments and so on and so forth. And, and from there, I pretty much put an end to it. I can't t- say anymore. But, but well, sure, sure. No, I figured there would be a, a hard out on that, on that yeah. question. So, um, so we, we brought you to, uh, to the show today to talk about one, one of many roles that you've had, but uh, namely, you've several times, it seems you've been a chief information security officer or CISO. Um, InfoSec is all about uh, boot camp security information training and we want people to not only, you know, take classes and get certifications, but understand what it takes to get into uh, certain career tracks, certain industries, and so forth. So what were some of the major steps along the way, uh, and what were the progression of skill sets that got you to a point of being a CISO? Sure, sure. So for me, because I started out as a information security or security um, expert, you'd say, around technology, okay. I started out as a CISO right very early in my career, right? During college, they needed it. There was really no such thing out there. There, it was, it was hit and miss. And because of my security expertise and my opportunities that I'd seen in the market space and expanded my own knowledge set, it was a good shoe in because it could also help expand the product set we were selling, which was a very security focused product around parental controls and helping protect the individuals from, from the, the misuse or the, uh, the malware or what have you on the outside. I was that guy that understood that. So not only did I drive internal security, but also the external product security. And then the evolution of that was eventually when I ended up working for Sprint, I worked for a chief security officer who was, and there's a vast difference between a CSO and a CISO in many organizations. And working for that CSO, he was a retired FBI agent, and he helped me understand. I was was very uh, full of myself, I say, or arrogant, because I knew technology very well. But he to me early and said, you know, you may know that technology, but you do not know governance and you do not know physical security. And so he opened my eyes and understanding this is how governance works and how it applies across HR, legal, into audit, into the, the board of directors, um, how you work with the CFO, how a CIO is different from a CTO. He began to really open my eyes and understanding as he opened his own eyes because he had spent years in the FBI. It was his real new experience. The first major role he had taken from the FBI over into uh, that, that sector, into the, the Fortune 500, was Sprint. So he helped me open my perspective from that point of view. Then I moved over and worked for a CISO inside of AT&T. That CISO, Ed Amoroso, was, was one of my greatest mentors as well. He helped me then dig deeper into the technology. He's a PhD. He's published, I think, 12 books at this point. Um, and really began to help me understand, okay, now that you know governance and you know physical, you definitely know technology, let me show you how to meld this together. 
yeah. and how it applies into the national security space, how it applies into the federal space, how it applies into um, big business, um, small, medium-sized businesses, enterprise, and so on and so forth. So those are the, the knowledges and experiences I recommend back to many and how you get into the CISO space. Interesting. So um, do you feel, I, I, like you say, uh, you became a CISO in part because, or CISO in part because it, it was just starting and you were there when it started and so forth. Do you feel like these milestones are still applicable to the present day? What are what are some of the um, uh, the sort of higher bars that have happened now that now that CISO is kind of an established field that, that w- would not have applied to you? Absolutely. You know, what's interesting is um, I spend a great deal of time with many CISOs and CSOs across multiple verticals, right? And that's been part of the reason I made a, a major career shift into the P&L space is because I could help them um, rethink and retool their business while giving information sharing across other verticals and global industries. Because a vertical inside the United States is many times very different from a vertical inside of EU and inside of uh, APAC or CEUK. It just depends on where you're at. So for me, um, the, the most interesting part about, I say to CISOs today, is if you want to break into this field, there's a way you have to view it. So many CISOs didn't know what the security story really was just a few years ago. We may have been in security for years, but the security story, we help paint that. And so I spell it out like this. It's around governance, technology, physical. But then it's not just around cyber. Many people go, oh, security is all about cyber. No. Right. Many of the CISOs I tell them is you want to find your way out of IT if possible or out of technology and find your way into HR or into legal or some other the organization, even directly into the CEO. Because the relevance is cyber is only one of four major areas or towers of cyber, cyber being application infrastructure, um, you know, data, databases, so on and so forth. We also have identity access management, governance, risk and compliance, and then digital. And digital is a mixture of cloud, IoT, analytics, social media, artificial intelligence, and all those other uh, IIoT as we move into operational technologies, right. all those components. Now, I realize there's bleed over among all of it, but if you spell it out, four distinct towers, you find your way into the way our security professional really thinks and how you can address that in the new world. And I tell folks, CISOs are the old world. The CTO, being the chief trust officer, is the new world. Hmm. This trust officer has security, privacy, and risk, three major components. And we're going to begin to see over the next three to five years the evolution of that role as the CISO steps into the chief trust officer and has security folks and has privacy and has risk. So that's how I'm viewing the today and the landscape to come. So it's really shifting a lot in the last couple of years, it sounds like. Yes. This chief trust officer is going to become the go-to focal point that drives the budget mm-hmm. and works as a peer to the HR, the head of HR, the peer to the head of audit, a peer to the head of legal, a peer to the head of, of CTO that works in the lines of business, CIOs, and has a board, has a seat on the board of directors. And that's the budget concerns in the real um, interworkings. The thing is that's most important that people forget is that we need to be NIST and ISO aligned. So it's all around baseline policies first, then your, your deep dive standards around those, and then the procedures themselves. And that applies back out to all areas of the business. And having that, that focal, okay, it's not just around security, it's not just that technology, it's governance first, and then into these other areas. The one who knows that is the one that wins. And those are in the big Fortune 500. Those are going to be the multi, multi-million dollar a year jobs. Wow. And so that's that evolution where the yeah. security expert becomes uh, the real powerhouse. It's also a place where you can you can uh, get yourself into a lot of trouble, right? Because you have so much exposure. It's up to you to solve the challenge. You, you The buck literally stops with you. Yes. Yeah. So um, we're, 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 we were coming right toward my next question here. So you've, you've sort of described the strata of uh, responsibilities of a, of a CISO and so forth. Could you sort of walk me through the day-to-day activities of a CISO? What types of jobs and responsibilities are you actually doing with your fellow CTOs, CIOs, the board of directors? What are you doing on a daily basis with HR and so forth? Sure. So um, the, the day-to-day piece around it is, is pretty much the same when it comes to security. You've got your operational pieces. You've got your relationship pieces, you have your technology pieces, and then you have your governance pieces. And it's around steering committees and ensuring you have the right senior executives on the steering committees so that we know where budget allocation goes. And then it's working back with all the key um, uh, go-to executives in the organization. So an example, if you go into CISO today, many of them will work up and through IT and they'll drive the, uh, the, the functions that are there. But then the challenge is that network 
is something that ends up separate or it's not a part of it. So they have to see, how do I work back into the CNO, chief network officer, or how do I work back into the lines of business that now have CTOs? So if you get into operational technology, CTOs are driving all of that with IoT or IIoT. And so they have to have um, those relationships in their day-to-day uh, business. And then at the same time, you've got to drive, if you look at, you have compliance, you have regulatory, you have vulnerability assessment, vulnerability management, threat management. You have um, enterprise security management. You have device management. You, you just go down the stack of all these pieces that are very, very, very important to the bigger picture. And them in their day-to-day um, role is to in- integrate and cooperate and um, ensure that there is a cohesiveness across all those areas of business. And so that's the real CISO today is doing that, or the real security czar is doing that in order to, to drive business. Well, at the same time, there's only one reason that we're there. It's ensuring revenue. And many of them lose sight of that. So um, I'll tell folks, you've got to make sure that whatever you're doing is driving or helping drive revenue. Um, and that's the new, the new way of, of ISOs and biz ISOs, tech ISOs, is ensuring that they're finding ways to that revenue. Being internal, finding ways to revenue, or ensuring um, that the external business is enabled to find revenue. Yeah. Um, regarding uh, CISO as, as a position, are you uh, sort of the manager of the sort of security department or do you work more closely with your fellow C-suite people? Do you sort of work in the upper strata? Do you manage much day-to-day operation or are you sort of working on, on a more sort of um, long-term plan level on the, on the, for the most part or, both, or a bit of both? Both, both. So the CISO, they, they need to one, work with their peers and mm-hmm. work for management in order to develop a, a long-term roadmap, 36-month roadmap around how their strategy looks and how it aligns back into the business. Well, at the same time, uh, going back into their own organization and treating themselves as centers of excellence so that they're easy to do business with and they're working out across CIOs and CTOs. That's their primary focus. Are we easy to do business with? Do we ensure the state of, of security? And at the same time, do we drive revenue by getting out of the way but at the same time, enabling. So many times we have to do, we have to get in the way, but at the same time, that protects our brand. So it's again, protecting, and, and that again drives revenue. So it's a multifaceted, multi-tiered approach that a CISO, a proper CISO needs to do. What are some of your favorite, uh, best, most interesting parts of the job uh, when, you're, when you're a CISO? Uh, what are you, what, and what are the most difficult and repetitive? Like what are the things you like? What are the things you don't like? I would say the most important or the thing that I enjoy the most is the community. Um, the community at large outside of my organization, the community at large inside my organization. Hmm. And um, I call it GSIC, the Global Security Intelligence Community. And working with those across internal, it being the verticals of uh, the business itself inside the United States, inside the regional sides of verticals inside Europe, same thing with APAC, and being able to um, take knowledge added or knowledge learned, lessons learned, and apply those back into um, what I do today. It's interesting. One of the things that people say, well, it's very different how we do security here in Europe, or it's very different how we do security in Asia Pac. And I say, no, it is not. Security is security. It is very much the same. Now you can pretend that it's different and you can isolate and silo yourself from the rest of the greater community or the organization at large, but that thinking is very co- career limiting and is guaranteed failure. The only way to guarantee success for yourself in a bigger picture career move is to remove the doors, remove the windows, and in best case, remove the walls to where you become a non-siloed thinking, non-siloed organization that communicates back out. Yes, we are about information protection. We're about certain things that we have to ensure safety or secure and that no one can get access to. But the one thing that we have to maintain is constant communication and open dialogue with our peers, with our our employees, and with those that we work for to ensure success. I tell folks, the three-letter agencies, and when you get the top secret and you get the national security, it's easy to get a siloed thinking. That is not the right way to do business if you're working in any type of enterprise or small, medium-sized business. The only way to be successful is to remove the doors, remove the windows, and open all dialogue. Level five leadership. I love that from Tim Collins to the good to great. A great CISO maintains level five leadership. That's the answer to success. If you find that, you're, you're guaranteed. One of the things I've said to CX CISOs who, and they say CISOs longevity can be cut very short. The reason being an example is ITO, IT outsourcing. If you talk to CISO 36, 48 months ago, they'd say, I will never outsource any of my security. That's crazy. I'm not sending it offshore, so on and so forth. 
You know what happened is the board of directors, the CFO, they stepped in and said, I don't care what you don't want to do. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. And those who argued and fought back lost their job. And I know many CSO, CISOs that said, all right, I want to continue to work. I did lose my job. I'm going to do it right the next time. And so here we are again, the next level around moving everything to the cloud and moving into a software defined world. Many of them have said, all right, I learned my lesson from the first time in the ITO, ITO outsourcing. We're still seeing ITO outsourcing. We're even seeing total lift and shift where even the CISO themselves are being outsourced into Indian-based outsourcing or into some type of outsourcing organization. I know for a fact because I've done that with Cognizant. I've done that with IBM. I've done that now inside of DD with NTT. And the interesting part is we move into software defined. 29% of the budget inside of CISOs is moving towards software defined or cloud-based um, uh, security. So here we are again. I say to the CISOs, move with it, do the right things. We have next in CASB. We have all these solutions. We'll see this continue to evolve and grow. Be a, a, thought, a thought leader, a forward thinker, and you can drive change. But if you dig your heels in the ground, you're going to become a dinosaur. And so that's, that's my, uh, my greatest gift and suggestion to many of the CISOs. And I have a lot of friends in this space. So, so we talk about it regularly. That sounds like uh, everybody write that down. This is this is the uh, this is the key takeaway right here. So <laughs> everyone listening. Um, so what sorts of activities uh, should you really be interested in or enjoy doing if you're thinking of becoming a CISO? What's the thing that you do every day? It sounds like communication is a big part of it. Communication is my primary. Um, yeah. One thing I tell people is if we get hit by the biggest hearth gun in the world and all technologies cease to exist, the one thing that we have today, the love in a hundred years, a thousand years from now and 10,000 years ago is relationships. Yes. The answer to all things is build a cohesive network of relationships, not just within your security community, which is very important, but build those relationships outside the organization. There's nothing worse when I hear a CISO who's at odds with audit. That should never happen. They should be best friends with audit. Or a CISO who's at odds with HR because the way policies are designed and driven out into the organization. That's just never happened. Legal, you know, e-discovery, all these things. It's important to have key critical relationships. And if you're not good at building relationships, I suggest you find a way to get good at it because your career will, will come to a dead halt. But if you master those relationships, and that's, of course, what I love about what I do, you're going to make sure your career flourishes because people love you. And it's not that we need to be loved. It's that we must be loved. It's the only way we can make this successful. So um, what role do you feel that professional certifications play in the enhancement of a security career? You, you obviously have a couple of degrees there. Do you feel that uh, getting cybersecurity degrees or sort of upper level degrees is a beneficial thing in, in this particular position? And uh, what certifications do you think are going to be most important to uh, CISO aspirants in 2019? Absolutely. So to young folks who are coming in, um, I say get a degree in cybersecurity if you think that's the right move, especially one that's NSA aligned, because there's many programs that the NSA is funded in our backing. And there's guarantee that you'll find many of those avenues that are relevant to getting you into the market space quickly. Uh, for those who don't have those degrees, not a problem. My degrees weren't in security as well. Um, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to learn to think outside the box. However, I say to those folks, the fastest way, and, I, and I've taught this to many people who want to take this path, the security, and, and I'm not an advocate for any one of the, the certifications, but I will say one of the fastest ways is if you want to know the technology, learn the security plus. And if you want to know the governance, learn the CISSP. People have an opinion about both of those. That's fine. I'm just giving an example of a road yep. to take. When you take those, then getting out into the greater community, ensuring that you're a part of those working groups, those monthly working groups, biweekly working groups, the CISO working groups in your local community, local chapters. And the more you dig into that within 12 to 24 months, you'll have a job as a CISO because not only can you then talk to security in a way that most people could never comprehend, you'll then know how to have those conversations in ways that other people um, know how to communicate with you. Then you can show, I've been doing security my entire career because the reality of it is we all do security to some degree. And if you know the ins and outs of security, you'll find that many people are afraid of what we do because they just don't understand how it's applicable. But reality of it is, if you know the, 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 the foundation around Security Plus, CISSP, you're guaranteed success. You will find your way into a role that makes good sense to you. Of course, the key there is you've got to get outside the box, right? Okay. Get outside, travel, go to know people, yeah. know their business, expand your horizons. And every time you think you've, you've hit the, 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 oh, I made it. No, expand it. Build your box bidding. No more. Go, go, go. Drive, drive, drive. Never stop learning. That's more people. Yeah. Yes. 
Meet everybody. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I guess to that end, what type of companies require a CISO? I mean, it sounds like it's pretty much every level of, of, of business shy of, you know, local mom and pop uh, probably needs one, you know, of, of any certain size. What types of professional companies should you be trying to be employed at to make yourself desirable as a future CISO? Absolutely. So I would say any one of the small, medium-sized businesses would need a CISO. They might not need it full-time, and they might need it as a manager or a director of security. Mm-hmm. They might also just work through a consulting firm to help provide that value add back to you. Um, then you get into enterprise, large Fortune 500, global. All of them need CISOs to some degree. Some will bring in as directors. Many of them don't understand the, the, the value add. An example is when I look at some of these manufacturing companies, they have Um, a director of security who works up through the ISO and they want to evolve and move into the IIoT space. They're they're It's just happening through the manufacturing. They're, they're, they're a little bit behind the curve. And I say to them, get ahead of the curve, get a CISO who gets up to the the board of directors who has access, probably reports up into HR and to leave, maybe directly to the CEO that then works with the lines of business and the CTOs. Um, Each one of those people go, oh, this company, this type of uh, vertical is a dinosaur. No, it's not a dinosaur. Security is becoming, it may appear to be a dinosaur, but they're still growing. That's why they're in business. And security is becoming the number one focal point as the evolution occurs, as we move into this next space of everything connected. So I would say all of those areas have a relevance. And for anyone who wants to get into the space, I tell them, if you go into consulting, you can find your way quickly into an organization just by those small ones that need to know how security works. And then you can move your way up. You can also, I have a, a great friend who works across four major companies as a consultant. He built out full-time into four companies and acts as a, on the board of directors because they don't want to pay somebody, but they need his expertise. And getting somebody who's an expert like him is rare. So there's all types of different avenues around who needs a CISO. Hmm. So realistically, you could get started in almost sort of a freelance or consulting space as long as you have the, the knowledge and you can sort of start low and build your way up. Absolutely. And yeah. outside the knowledge, have the confidence. Yeah. Yeah. And the communication skills. Absolutely. With that, it's it's easy, right? Because people don't know. And if you know more than they do, give them that knowledge, go figure it out as you go, and then suddenly you'll become even better at it. But just right. confidence in what you know and allow the rest to happen. So what are some of the common pitfalls that CISO aspirants make along the way and how can you avoid them? Are there sort of unnecessary tasks or resume fillers that people think that they're they're helping, but they're, they don't really make a difference? Yes. Um, one pitfall, they do not listen to the, D, D, the, D, the, the uh, board of directors. Mm-hmm. They do not listen to the CFO. They do not listen to their peers. And with that not listening, they may think they're listening, but they're listening through a, a lens that's not, or, or, or watching through a lens um, in a way that's not relevant to one security, not relevant to the business and driving additional revenue, not relevant to everything that's important to uh, those in charge, right? And what's important to Wall Street. They're just, they they don't remove the blinders. That's the first thing. Um, another one, they don't fight for what's relevant. They don't fight for what's important to their business. They um, don't use their voice so that they grow their, their capacity in order to support the rest of the organization. Um, then the next one, the third most important, I say it over and over, is they somehow interfere with making revenue in a way that feeds bigger business and that's very career limiting. They'll, they'll shut things down based on the SDLC at the wrong time because they didn't inject themselves into the, the, the mm-hmm. development cycle properly. Or they interfere back into a connected device in a way that impedes progress. And instead of saying, all right, go to market, let's figure out how to secure it as we go. We were a little late to the business. That's my fault. Or I wasn't here. I always wasn't done understand the business now that I'm getting it. Again, if they're communicating, many of those are going to come back to them at the right time and say, hey, we need you here. But if they're not getting out there and they're building relationships and being relevant, they're not going to get injected at the right times. And then, again, if you don't shut it down and they get hacked, who's to blame? Well, suddenly you're out of a job because they say, why didn't you get in the middle of it where you were needed? And why didn't you solve it when we need, needed you to solve it? So those are three of the major, major things that I say to people is, one, you're not communicating. Two, you're not listening. And um, three, you don't find the relevance back to is how to make revenue in the business. Okay, so uh, a lot of the listeners that we have on our show um, might not even be on a security track or they're very low in a security track. So what's what's one thing that you would suggest you could do in your current position that would move you one step closer to getting on the path of being a CISO? Like even if you're 
you know, in a non-security position, what would you say, you get home from work tonight and do this thing, start reading a thing, start doing a thing, volunteer a thing? Get your security plus, mm-hmm. get the ISSP. Okay. Plug into a mentor who's a CISO or a secure, head of security. Mm-hmm. Of would love to help people. Most people don't ask. And most importantly, and I, and I say there's three um, because this is on the side, community. Plug into a community. Okay. Not only to a person as a mentor, but plug into a community, local community, um, national community, everywhere and anywhere you can. With those three things, you will be a CISO within 24 months. Wow. Uh, so where do you see security practices going in 2019 and in the years to come? What are some innovations and ideas you're looking forward to seeing or are driving yourself? So the way I view it is from a strategic perspective, there are three towers. Okay. And three towers. The first one is, first, you're going to see most organizations break out into a multi-tiered, multi-tower um, approach around cyber, GRC, identity access management, and digital. And of course, national security is always there, right? Uh, that multi-towered approach is what's leading into, most importantly, digital transformation. Hmm. So of those four towers, you can look at that one as the middle tower. So this is today, those, those tower approaches are GRC, cyber, identity access management. The journey to tomorrow is around digital as we move into IoT, as we move into cloud, we move into analytics and so on and so forth. And tomorrow is all around software defined, securing the software defined and putting security into software defined. I tell people that if you look at from that those are the strategies of today, tomorrow, and the future. And if you can get behind that, you'll realize the answer to all of it is around platforms and advisory services. If you're using platforms to your advantage and advisory services to your advantage as a current CISO, you're going to address all of identity access management, GRC, and cyber. And you're going to get that to help you feed across the transformation journey through digital into software defined. And then if you create exploratory committees, and you have the right alliances with the business, you're going to define multi-cloud and hybrid which, over here, which is going to feed right, right back across because uh, both of those are very important to melding it all together. If your strategy addresses those properly over 36 months, if you need to bring in an outside consultant or if you can do it yourself, fantastic, or work with your local community, that's how you're going to ensure success for yourself and your business over 36 months. So as we wrap up today, could you tell me a little bit about your current role with Dimension Data? What type of data and security services does your company provide for their customers and what's your company's big initiatives for 2019? Sure. So for myself personally, I'm, I'm uh, Vice President GM over all of the Americas, including Latin America and Canada for all okay. security. Um, it's a blend of DD, NTT as we become NTT Inc. And um, with that, I currently, my, my major initiative, and which is glo- driving from a global initiative, is moving into what we call 60-40 split. And so 60-40 split means, sure, we sell technologies today at 60% of our business, but 40% of that we drive is actual DD, NTT-led services. Those services of that, 50% of those are managed security services, 20% of those are consulting services, being uh, business consulting, and the other uh, percentage of it is the uh, professional services or technology consulting. And my business today, it's going into clients Helping them, so many of them are buying Cisco, they're buying Palo Alto, we're buying all these other type of vendors from us. We have so many different vendors we work with, but the most important part is adding on the value-add services that will help them as a CISO get to that next level, right? And helping them understand, we're not just going to toss a technology into your lap, we're going to wrap around, more importantly, the consulting services that help you address your 36-month roadmap around the strategy I talked to, and we have the feet on the ground around professional services and delivering it. And we can put the managed security services wrap around it to help you deliver and maintain the, the monthly recurring with what you need to get done. So we have that whole portfolio of services, and that's the relevance to what we do today at DD and TT. So um, how, how could people reach you if they want to want to find out more? Absolutely. Getting a hold of me at a personal level. I, I'm, you can find me at joshua.knight at dimensiondata.com. Great. And you have a, do, you have a, do you use social media at all, like Twitter or anything to... People want to follow? I, I do, and I don't have that on me, so we'll have to okay. look, yep. look, around, look around for Joshua Knight. Uh, okay, Joshua, thank you for being here with us today. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, and thank you all today for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in InfoSec Institute to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Please visit infosecinstitute.com slash cyberspeak for the full list of episodes. If you'd like to qualify for a free pair of headphones with a class sign-up, podcast listeners can go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast to learn more. 
And if you'd like to try our free Security IQ package, which includes free phishing simulators you can use to fake fish and then educate your colleagues and friends in the ways of security awareness, visit infosecinstitute.com slash security IQ. Thank you once again to Joshua Knight, and thank you all for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.